Well, hello, and welcome to the second episode of Ultimate Stream Live. Tonight, we're going to be talking to the multi award winning jazz vocalist, pianist, songwriter, and radio host, Ian Shaw, about his latest album, What's New. But first, we're going to talk about the Auralic Altair G1 digital streamer. Designed for ease of use, crystal clear sound, and highly flexible system configuration, the Altair G1 brings high performance, cutting edge technology, and incredible value to any high fidelity audio system. Music can be streamed from virtually any source, locally stored files on your network, internet radio, airplay, Bluetooth, USB drive, an optional integrated hard drive, or a playlist of favorites from a subscription-based streaming service such as Cobus or Tidal. Control is via either the proprietary Lightning DS app or the manual intuitive control on the front panel with all functions clearly displayed on the high resolution color display. Completing the Altair G1's extensive feature set, there's full wireless utility, smart IR controlled learning, and an advanced digital volume control. I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Bates, UK and European Sales Marketing Director for Auralic, and David Price, Editor in Chief at StereoNet. Richard has spent most of his working life in audio. He was with Meridian for 20 years before going into retail for six years and then joining Auralic back in 2016. David started writing for Hi-Fi World back in 1993. He then went on to become editor of Hi-Fi Choice before taking up his current position with StereoNet. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. We're going to discuss the Auralic Altair G1, but before we do, David, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about your role at StereoNet. Yeah, so I joined StereoNet, um, I think it was last November, and um, StereoNet is, a, is basically, it's an online hi-fi magazine, but it has two main sites. It's got the Australia New Zealand site and the UK site, and I'm kind of overseeing the, the uh, content on both of those. Of course, it's pretty wide, uh, diverse and uh, uh, eclectic collection of reviews there. I think it's true to say that the UK has got a more mature hi-fi industry than, yeah. uh, than Australia and New Zealand. So it's a bit more analog, I think, actually, in the UK than there is on the Australian site. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the Australian side is more kind of technological, technology, digital streaming, but that's not to say that UK doesn't have that. It's just a slight different, uh, different nuance. Richard, Orlac has grown considerably over the last few years. I came on board with Ultimate Stream around about the time of the G2 series launch, which was then followed by the G1 Airy Streamer and the G1 Vega DAC. So what was it that made the company decide to launch the Altair digital streamer? I think, Steve, when we, when we launched G1, the G1 series, which was on the back of G2 series, um, there were two models, a Vega G1 DAC, a streaming DAC, and then an Aries G1, which was the digital streamer. So there were two quite different products serving different purposes. Um, a streaming DAC as a preamp to go into a customer's traditional amplifier and passive speakers, or an Aries G1 transport with purely a digital output to feed into a customer's existing converter or digital speakers. So we saw an opportunity to bring amalgamate, if you like, those two products together and have all of the key features of both of those models in one unit, in one unit. At a, at a very attractive price. It's really a, a one, almost a one-stop solution for somebody who wants to have one product which will uh, encompass all of their music requirements. So they could listen to their television through it, stream music services, put music on a hard drive, either internally or on a network or an attached USB drive. Or you could even, with an A to D converter, play a record player through it, a turntable. So it really does do, do everything all in one product at a very attractive price. David, this is a pretty crowded sector of the market with lots of competition. Some good and some not so good. Your review gave the Altair five stars. What was it that made it stand above the competition? 
Well, I think you're right. I think there is um, uh, a lot of competition around now. Um, and uh, of course, it's not just from brands like Cyrus and NAD and, you know, the new Cord, Tugo, Hugo and, and the name ND5XS2, all those kind of rivals. Um, you also got the kind of hobbyist side where people are making streamers, you know, out of their Raspberry Pis and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a there's a lot of choice now in the market, and and that's really really changed. I think in the last few years, we've really seen that the whole genre kind of come come of age. Um, but what set the um, the the G1 out uh, for me was the the idea of it as a package. Um, you know, it, it's a very complete kind of fully rounded solution. It, it offers a uh, um, a blend of strengths, if you like, that, that I think is, is particularly appealing to certain types of buyers. Um, you know, each brand obviously sells to its, its faithful customers and also sells to, uh, to people who simply want something to do a job. Um, and I think the, the, the Auralic has, has an appeal that it's a very, um, it's beautifully built. It's got a lovely silky kind of uh, control action. It's got a really good app, actually. It surprised me how, how good it is. Um, and, um, you know, a nice display, which I think many people still, still like. Not, not every product has a good quality display. Um, and, and really um, impressive sound uh, as well. So it was a great all-round uh, Package and it, you, it kind of felt to me like a kind of baby high-end product, really, a sort of affordable, you know, audiophile thing that 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 does is a jack of all trades. It does a lot very well. I think it's going to attract people who don't want to fiddle around endlessly. Um, you know, it's, it's just going to be a kind of, I think, one step, one stop solution. I think for for a lot of people who just want a nice really well-made streamer sitting there in their system that they can just get on and listen to the music. Over the past few years, I think digital streamers have started to sound much more analogue-like and less digital. Is that something that you'd agree with, David? You think back to the early days. I mean, let's go back to Logitech squeeze boxes and stuff like that. They sounded like, you know, you were kind of your, your cranium was being drilled as you listen to the music. The modern streamers and modern DACs, um, I think are much smoother and more tonally balanced and have a kind of insight that, that, that you get without having detail kind of machine gunned at you. And certainly the, um, the uh, it's a ESS uh, Sabre DAC chip, I believe, isn't it, uh, Richard? Yeah, that's right, yeah. You know, it, it, it get, gets the job done very well. It's very even-handed and, uh, and, and capable, I think, um, in its way. Um, and, you know, it doesn't sound as fizzy and as hashy and as noisy as, uh, you know, something uh, from maybe five or ten years ago, certainly ten years ago. I think um, the other thing that, 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 that's, that's happened over the years, David, also is the fact that um, so much music now, modern music particularly, is being mixed and mastered far more sympathetically. Yeah. Whereas years and years ago, you know, we've all got CDs we started off with however many years ago that sound really quite thin and shabby. They, they did back then even. I think now with uh, music that's mixed and mastered today, it's, it's, it's far better than it was many, many years ago, it was primarily mixed for the analog format. Um, the A to D converters back then weren't as good as they are, are today. Um, things are, are, are sounding a lot better than they, they have ever done. You know, good modern recordings um, do a lot of things right that, that maybe uh, others didn't. And certainly, you know, 20 years ago, we were still uh, listening to transcriptions of analog, classic analog recordings that were pretty crudely transferred to, to CD and, uh, and um, you know, sometimes the EQ and all that kind of thing uh, wasn't, wasn't done well. Um, so yeah, modern, good modern recordings can sound really good now. And um, I think there's a bit of snobbery about, uh, among, in the hi-fi community about, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's always, the old stuff is always uh, better, but, I'm not quite so sure that's always true.
you know, I think the, obviously the big improvement now is high, high resolution A to D converters and so on using studios and high res digital recording and so on. And of course, DCS were doing that sort of stuff in the late 80s, early 90s, but it was hardly mainstream. And um, yeah. so I think that, uh, you know, we are beginning now to get into a stage where, um, you know, high res audio on new recordings is possible. And obviously if you have a streamer, which is not format specific, you know, you don't need to go down to the HMV Megastore or whatever to buy, to buy it on a certain format of disc. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you've got that great freedom now um, to, uh, yeah. to, to, to take things as they come. I think with the likes of uh, Cobas particularly and uh, a new service provider that we've just, in, just incorporated into our new app revision, uh, high resolution audio in Germany, um, native content, 2444, 2448, 2496, native, streamable from these service providers is sounding today really, really excellent. And again, prov providers like Cobas and, uh, and High Resolution Audio, they, they care about where they source their content from. I think the great thing about Cobas, and I love Cobas actually, um, because I was one of the old stick in the muds who... Uh, <laughs> totally not, David. <laughs> I've been very late to streaming uh, because it was such a pain it didn't sound as good as a, a, you know, a decent CD player. All the apps on the first or early generation ones didn't work and all the rest of it, or they crashed or whatever. Um, but now we're in a, a golden age, you know, you get onto Cobras or whatever and, and easily access high res music without having to bend over backwards to do it. And that's hugely liberating, I think. Richard, the, the Altair has a lot of features internet radio, streaming with Cobuzz, Tidal, Spotify. It's got its own internal hard disk as an option for people who want to store their own music library on there. Uh, it's a Rune endpoint, um, lots of different features. But it, one of the key things for me is that it's got its own app, Lightning DS. T tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, Lightning DS is our own our, our own proprietary application that, that we developed way back in 2014, so five, six years ago. And we went from version one up to version six that we're on now. We're just about in the next week or so going to launch version seven. And we believe it's very important to have um, what I think one of the things that makes Oralix such a compelling proposition as a complete system is that it's our own application our own server, our own hardware, all together. And that gives you, as David just cited, a very engaging, nice experience to listen to music with the minimum of fuss and pain. You can listen to your music, search for music. You can now control your system through the application as well. Um, again, with some of the online services, you can engage and get what we call booklet mode. Um, so you can look at uh, sleep notes of particular artists' recordings whilst you're listening to them, which is which is a really nice touch. I understand there's a Lightning DS upgrade just around the corner. Yeah, there is indeed, and it will go live probably in the next week to ten days with some very exciting new features. One big one, which is we're bringing CD ripping capability to all of our products. You can connect. Um, a CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, ripper drive, which isn't terribly expensive, um, to the USB port on the product. And within the application, or via the desktop web interface, you can choose to either play a CD in play mode, play a CD as you normally would, and skip through tracks in the app, or alternatively engage auto-ripping mode, where you just post your disc in, and it will rip the disc, go get the album artwork, the metadata, and then channel that data to either the internal storage within the product or to a connected USB drive to the product or a network attached storage drive, an AS drive. That's so a handy that, feature, that is. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing that we've been working on for a very long time. Uh, again, it's all our own proprietary technology, and uh, we, we're just about set to uh, to get that out. So, I think once we have that, that that really does give us an all-encompassing product that will do 
pretty much everything. Just add a pair of um, digital speakers or an analog amplifier and um, you have an Oralix system, which which will work really, really nicely. David, I was interested. In your review, you said you were clearly able to signpost the differences between earlier and more modern day recordings. You also said that you found yourself playing more music than you have done for a long time. Can you explain this? What I liked about the G1 was that I was just able to, you know, get it going, sit down, bang, you know, get the iPad out or whatever, and, and you're off. And then you've really unlocked the power of, of, of a modern streamer, haven't you? If you can do that without having yeah. to re reboot your computer every 10 minutes and go and switch your router on and off and stuff. So I found it really usable. The other thing, of course, is that it's fine if it's really easy to use, but if it sounds dreadful and you don't want to play it, then, you know, what's the point? Um, so I thought the, the G1 had a good combination of ease of use and really good sound quality. It's, uh, you know, it's open and clean and transparent enough, uh, especially for something of its price. You know, we're not talking a, a DCS Bartok uh, price here um, to, to kind of unlock the recording. So you can, you know, you can zing from kind of 60s, uh, late 60s rock classics like, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young's, uh, you know, Deja Vu to, to sort of modern, uh, you know, kind of drum and bass or something um, quite easily. <laughs> and you can hear the difference in sound quality. You can hear the difference in recording and mastering and all the rest of it quite explicitly um, and obviously that shows a good uh, you know sound attention to detail in, in, in the engineering of it. The Altair is not only a DAC streamer but a preamplifier as well. I often get customers asking me whether a unit like the Altair can replace a good quality preamplifier in a system. Have you got a view on this? If, you, if you've basically got a digital source system, um, then uh, you, you don't really need analog inputs um, and uh, you don't really need a you know, plethora of different, uh, you know, sort of phono inputs for different cartridges and so on. So if you're focused on digital, then there's a good argument to use it as a kind of DAC preamplifier. And I used it, uh, I don't think I mentioned it in the review, but I've got a really, uh, a beloved, uh, world audio design valve amplifier uh, that I've had for many years and that's been very heavily tweaked and uh, it's a power amp uh, and I use the, uh, the the G1 as a uh, you know uh, to control that and uh, you know it works very well so you can do that um, you can it mean it basically means if you're not heavily into analog you can uh, you can kind of work around it it's not going to be the sound quality equal of a two thousand pound analog preamplifier put it that way um in, in in one sense but as a digital digital device it's perfectly good i think um to be the heart of a a, a medium price digital system certainly and of course a, a stage up from the altair is the the vega g2 which rather unusually for a dac has a built-in analog input as well well, it sounds like a big thumbs up for the G1 Altair. But Richard, what's around the corner now for Auralic? Lots of exciting things planned. Um, so just around the corner we have, we're introducing a new G2.1 series. And this is really a, a, a revision to the G2 series that we launched some three years ago at uh, the Munich High End Show. A, a lot of the technology from G2 came down into Altair G1. So G2 really furthers, furthers the cause. It's, it, it's higher quality, higher quality components with a lot of segregation of componentry. So, for instance, with G2.1, you can build a four box system should you wish to do so. So all of these, the first products will come along will be the Aries G2.1 and Vega G2.1 uh, early June. And then shortly thereafter, Leo GX21 and the uh, Sirius G2. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. I'm sure our paths will cross again in the not too distant future. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure to talk as always. And David, good to speak with you. And uh, yeah, let's do this again sometime. Cheers, guys. Take care. Thank you.
Welcome to Jazz by Request, the multi-award winning jazz vocalist, songwriter, pianist and radio host, Ian Shaw. Ian has been described by Jazz Times in the US as the greatest male vocal jazz singer the UK has to offer. Hi Ian. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. We've just seen an extract from the video, We Stop Talking, which you've just released with pianist Jamie Safir. Can you tell us a little bit about the song? I live pretty much in central London and I'm very conscious of the homeless situation since lockdown, in fact, because a lot of the rough sleepers have moved from, have been moved on and some of them have moved themselves because there's no one there to look after them, to give them the odd fiver or to give them food. And a lot of the distribution points in central London have closed down, certainly some of the hostels as well. So they're moving to the outskirts. So where I live, I live in Lambeth, which is just over the bridge. And I'm noticing a lot of rough sleepers having a terrible time because you can't really give them money because of the whole nature of, you know, of social distancing. And I thought it'd be nice to combine that with my ongoing work with a, a refugee charity, which I've been a trustee of for five years called SideBySideRefugees.org. And okay. my lovely buddy Jamie uh, and I came up with this. Uh, in fact, I've got the book right here. We were inspired by my friend Robert Elms' book, which is called London Made Us, a memoir of a shape-shifting city. And I got the idea of a sort of love letter to to London and all that it throws up and all that it's thrown up in my lifetime. And and that's how the that's how the song came about. We Stop Talking came about from a conversation that Robert used to have with his father about politics and music every Sunday after lunch. And then when his father died, when Robert was a little kid, the conversation stopped. So we stopped talking and he started walking. So as a young teenager, he started walking the streets of London. So that's where the song came about. Ian, I want to talk to you about your new album. But before I do, I know that you're pretty involved with Ronnie Scott's and you present the Ronnie Scott's radio show on Jazz FM. How did this all start? I feel like I've known Ronnie Scott's since almost since I left home, I'm from North Wales, and I used to sort of sneak in there under literally under people's coats when I was 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, to see all these amazing players. And later on, thanks to a great guy called Brian Blaine, who used to be very a big cheese at the Musicians' Union, he sent a tape of my band Brave New World to Ronnie Scott's, and I got the gig. Um, and it was a kind of rock funk outfit, which I co-formed with a keyboard player called Adrian York. And Ronnie heard me sing and said, oh, you should, you should sing jazz. And okay. I used to sit in with his band and he'd write down lots of titles of songs that he grew up with, which eventually became one of my albums. Sadly, he didn't play on it because he said he was playing like Bill Clinton at the time. And then years later, um, I was just asked whether I would like to, 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 to carry on with the Ronnie Scott show, which, which, had been, which had started with a wonderful uh, broadcaster and a very good friend of mine called Jumoke Fashola. And she moved on to the BBC and I took over um, at Jazz FM, just doing this one show, which we syndicate all over the world. And in it, it's fun because I get, to, I get to interview all my heroes, really, which are, over the years who've become quite good friends of mine. Recently, I interviewed George Benson. Uh, we have Gregory Porter. So it's, it's, it's um, and with lockdown, people are quite eager to talk about their music in a way that they couldn't before because maybe they were on the road or they were tired or they, they were rehearsing. So we couldn't normally do these wonderful things that you, that you do. So this has given us time because I feel like I haven't sung for nine weeks, you know. It's given us time to reflect on all this and, and, and radio is a great, I'm very lucky that that's that's that, that's continuing and I'm able to do it here with my my clever little microphone. So you've released some 15 albums now 
The latest is What's New, which is a collaboration with the piano genius Jamie Saffir and the legendary jazz saxophonist Ian Ballamy. I know that Ian's appeared on four of your previous albums. How did the three of you meet? And how did the idea come about of releasing this album? Jamie Saffir, um, I'm, I met him when he was just 20, 21, I think. Uh, he was at the Guildhall School of Music. And his nana, um, I met his grandmother in, in, up in uh, Cheshire doing a workshop. And she, she's a wonderful singer. And she said, oh, you, you need to meet our Jamie. He's gone down to London. And I'm like, yes, you know, this, this always happens when you do gigs. And I did. And we clicked as not just as, as um, friends, but so we, we love the same kind of music. And he loves working with singers. And he knew Ian Ballamy through um, the Guildhall School of Music. Uh, a lot of his friends had lessons with Ian Ballamy. And Ian and I have known <laughs> since 1483. Um, I used to go and hear Ian uh, play with Loose Tubes at Ronnie Scott's. The album features new arrangements of Songs of Love and Hope with classics by Leonard Bernstein and Burt Bacharach and Hal David. Where do you start when choosing songs for an album? And why did you choose the songs that you did? Well, I think an album has to sort of capture where you are in your life, really. And uh, this particular album came from Ian, Ian Ballamy. Uh, uh, his father and his mother um, fell in love to a lot of those songs, a lot of those standard songs. And he recently lost his father, so it was a fitting tribute, really, to Ian's dad, who died, and his mother, who's still very much around. And there's a song on there called um, uh, I, I only, I'll Only Miss Him When I Think Of Him, which was famously recorded by Frank Sinatra, because I'm a gay man, I sang, I didn't sing what he sang, I sang him instead of her. And it seemed to work, because it, it was a great tribute to, that was the song that started the whole album, really. Some of his choices were quite strange. I didn't expect him to choose the Bacharach, for example, but Ian loves a, a good melody as well. <laughs> so that's how it came about. And Jamie came up to the plate and was fantastic. And instantly they created arrangements on the spot in the studio. So the album was recorded at Cooper Hall in Somerset. Why did you choose this venue? And how long did it take to record the album? Well, it took, I think it took two or three days. We rented a cottage in this amazing place, Cooper Hall, which is in the estate of a very nice um, married couple who put on concerts, recitals, and workshops in this stunning purpose-built concert hall. And it's a beautiful acoustic space. So we recorded the album with a, a great engineer called Ben Findlay, who's worked with Van Morrison, Peter Gabriel, and he's also local. So what you hear really is what you get. We didn't really repair anything or do any tuning or edit anything. It's just, we just chose what we thought was the most fitting version of the songs. You know, we did two or three takes of each song and then chose the best ones, I hope, anyway. I noticed to my mind that there are a couple of missing instruments, drums and bass. What made you decide to exclude these from the album? Well, we, most of my albums are quite textured and quite full from, you know, orchestra, uh, strings, guitar, backing vocals. You know, I just on, I did two albums recently on the Jazz, the Jazz Village, the French uh, label. Um, we, you know, where I layered up my own voices to make a gospel choir, and and I just thought it'd be nice to sort of return to that very intimate, um, almost chamber sound. And Jamie is the kind of pianist that has this inner pulse. So he plays completely orchestrally when he's playing. And then when he's soloing, it then condenses into a different kind of moment and we can step back. So it, 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 it would only work with certain piano players, I think. But with him, it certainly does work. Ian, several of your albums are available on vinyl as well as CD and download. Was there any particular reason or do you just like vinyl? Well, I love vinyl. I mean, this my, I've got thousands of albums. I call them records, really. You know, I'm old enough to be able to call them records, not vinyl. Um, uh, but I love the warmth and the crackle, always have done. I Like a lot of people, I went for years, probably 20 years, without having a record player and maybe gave, I think I gave a lot of my albums away. Some, some of them I cherished. I've got the original um, David Bowie 
gatefold here, Aladdin's Zane, um, with an amazing sort of middle, which I had when I was a kid. And my friend Linda Lewis, who sang on this album, came for dinner recently and with her lovely dog, and we got very drunk. And I said, you need to sign this album, because <laughs> she sings on it. I know you've released some of the songs on video, which were filmed during the lockdown. We're going to see a clip now from Once Upon a Summertime, composed by Michel Legrand, who sadly we lost last year. Now another winter time has come and gone The pigeons feeding in the square have flown But I remember when the vespers chimed you loved me once upon a summertime. That's a great song. I understand you once worked alongside Michelle Legrand. Well, it only happened once. It was in Boston and it was probably about 12 years ago, I think, and it was him guesting, it was four singers, and we were guesting with the Boston Pops Orchestra, and he was the guest piano player playing his arrangements. Um, and I, I sang, what are you doing uh, the rest of your life? He was going to do a concert this year at the Royal Festival Hall, mm. and the promoter, James Albrecht, at Fame Productions, decided he'd carry on with the concert, but without him. So a lot of the artists that were lined up to perform, Maria Friedman, um, Tamsin Little. Sadly, he died last year, didn't he? He did, yeah. So he did, he wasn't there, but it was an it was an extraordinary night, and I got to sing "Once Upon a Summertime" um, that night alongside you know Alison and the other performers, and also Benjamin Legrand, his son, who sort of co compared the evening with Jeremy Sams, the theatre de director and producer. Um, so it was a very special night, full of huge Legrand enthusiasts and it's quite nerve-wracking playing in front of fans of a particular composer um but I like to think that I do my own thing with things anyway so people understand that um I'm fairly faithful to the original melody and chords um and Once Upon a Summertime I think is a very beautiful it's almost like a suspended breath on a summer's day so when we did the video in lockdown i mean i nearly got arrested because i was standing opposite <laughs> mi5 or mi6 because I, I live very close to the river here and i was filming myself <laughs> it was like you know a classic excuse me sir <laughs> but um and jamie filmed himself in his garden and ian who lives in a beautiful house in in the in somerset filmed all these beautiful images of him and his dog and his saxophone. And it came together really well. And you had a European tour plan which got cancelled because of the lockdown. Do you have any plans for some new dates, assuming we can all start attending gigs again later on this year? Nobody knows really, Steve. You know, it's, it's one of those, it's for the first time in my lifetime, the whole world is on pause, isn't it? It is. And all it the is. things that we're used to, need they need to take either a different a different turn or we just need to pause even further and just accept the consequences and economically i'm very conscious of how things are going to fall apart and it could take many many years to rebuild them especially with the arts so i guess i should ask you what you're working on now and what the immediate future holds i talk for a living so i i thought and i, lo I love to write i have loads and loads of pieces of prose that i've written um and I just thought it'd be nice to do a podcast. I'm going to do one. Jamie's going to produce it. Uh, wonderful Howard Lester, who runs the website, is going to look at it as well. I've got my friend Tristan Ryder, who's a composer, to write the theme music for it. So it, it might be fun, or it might not be fun. I don't know. I'm going to give... I'll do a pilot and see how it goes. And I'm also doing uh, arrangements of new... Arrangements of David Bowie and Joni Mitchell songs for a, a new project, which is hopefully going to be a live project with my with my trio. And I also work with an Italian trio I'm very proud of as well. And we have an album called Integrity, and that's Enzo Zurilli on drums, um, Tommaso Scanapieco on bass, and Alessandro Di Liberto on piano. And we're putting a little single out soon called People, which is the famous Julie Stein, Barbara Streisand one. So that a video, it goes up next week, I think, um, on YouTube. 
Ian, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure for me and I wish you every success for the future. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your support. And that's a beautiful shirt. I'm very jealous. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that's about all we've got time for this evening. I'll be back in a couple of weeks, so I hope you'll be able to join me then. You can find all the links relating to this episode on our website, ultimate-stream.live. But for now, I'm going to leave you with Once Upon a Summertime from the latest album, What's New, by Ian Shaw. See you soon. Beside a little flower stall A bunch of bright forget-me-nuts Was all I'd ever let you buy me Once upon a summertime Just like today We laughed the happy afternoon away And stole a kiss At every street cafe On the tree I was as proud As any man could be As if the man Had offered me The key to Paris Now Another winter time Has come and gone The pigeons feeding In the square have flown But I remember when the vespers chime You loved me once upon a summertime Thank you.